This is Jadecast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Hello everyone and welcome back to Jadecast. Today I would like to provide you with some good sound advice that might be innovative for you about how to think of joint locks which would enable you to both apply joint locks better and defend against them in a superior manner. You ready? Let's go! So the number one problem that I always see with people dealing with joint locks be they in stand-up grappling or on the ground is that people put their attention and intention where the joint lock is happening. Here's what I mean. Say you have two people and one is putting a joint lock on the wrist of the other. How am I going to defend against that? There are many types of techniques but let me tell you this, this very simple logic. In order for a joint lock to be successful, what we require is stability. Now, isn't that paradoxical, right? We're trying to break or sprain something, but to do that, we need stability. What I mean by that is, it's like you're trying to uh, cut something in the kitchen. You want a stable surface you are not trying to cut something typically on the back side of a round ball. You want a cutting board. You want to be sturdy and stable and be able to absorb the type of pressure that you are exerting, right? And so same with joint locks. And this is a good thing to think about because if we destabilize, we usually tend to disable, at least partially, the ability of the other person to put the joint lock on us. So, as and, and we know this, I mean, even beginners tend to know this, if we move too much, it's more difficult to apply a joint lock on us. But what do we do when we are already inside of a joint lock? If someone had put a lock on one of our joints and we find we're stuck there, and what happens to most people is that they tend to just focus on where the joint lock is happening. So someone's trying to lock their wrist, their elbow, doesn't matter, their, their ankle, and they try to resist where this is happening. They're trying to flex the muscle and tendons around that joint, right? And, and they're trying, they're basically beginning to engage in this competition of endurance with the other person and what often happens is either the person uh, on which someone is trying to apply the lock either the, that person is going to uh, run out of stamina and then the lock would be successful or the person who is uh, trying to apply the lock wouldn't have uh, his strength anymore after one or two minutes and or even a few seconds depending on the situation and then the lock wouldn't be successful etc etc and you can think about this uh, via, again, the manner of using various techniques, but there's a much, much easier way to conceive of how to deal with joint locks when you have to defend against them. Now, how to use the same logic when you apply joint locks, I'll get to in a moment. So, the only thing you, you, have to, you need to have in mind is that you would like to move every single body part that is not being locked because this stabilizes the whole area where the joint lock needs to happen. Now granted, you need to resist to some extent, to some degree. You must put in a little bit of resistance where the joint lock is happening so you wouldn't get a sprain or a break applied onto you, right? You, we, we can't run away from that. However, you want to put the absolute minimal amount of resistance necessary so you won't, wouldn't get too tired. At least the minimal amount that you could put for 5 or 10 seconds at, at most. And at the same time, you have to release and relax your entire body and feel, okay, 
which parts of my body can I move that are not locked into position? Now, for instance, in, in ground grappling, what hap often happens, if your opponent is very skilled, he's not just locking one joint, he's locking several joint into, joints into place and then applying the break or, or the spraining attempt to one particular part, but he's making sure that your entire body would be stable so he could do that. And what do we do then? Well, there is always, there are always many body parts that are not under our opponent's control. For example, typically our nose is free to move, our eyes are free to move, our neck, unless the lock is on the neck, the neck is free to move, right? One or two of the shoulders could move if the lock is on one of the legs. Maybe our, the fingers, the fingers of our palms, they could move. Maybe our chest could move, it could expand and contract, concave or, uh, or protrude out. Maybe our spine can move up and down, sideways, snake itself in various shapes. Maybe our hip joints can rotate. What could possibly move which is not under the opponent's control? You would quickly discover, and you can experiment with this with uh, your friends or colleagues, that typically, with, in most situations, whichever lock is applied onto you, if you just let your friend or colleague hold you in that lock and not really try to hurt you, and you experiment, you find out that there are quite a lot of body parts that could move in all different directions. Even your tongue, your tongue is all, almost always free. I mean, somebody could potentially be grabbing your tongue. I don't know, but it doesn't happen often. So what happens is with every additional body part that you move, and especially if each and every body part is moving in a different direction or making a different shape. So one body part can move linearly. Say uh, your elbow is going to move up and down, but your, one of your shoulders is going to rotate in a circle and your, your other knee is going to extend so each one of those parts is doing something else the more of this stuff is going on at the same time the more difficult it would be for your opponent to apply the lock and it doesn't matter which lock because the opponent like we said earlier requires stability and if your body is totally unstable, everything is moving at the same time, almost everything, and all in different directions, then this whole structure that the opponent is trying to control would become very, very difficult to tame. Very difficult to lock. I guarantee you that. And the more skilled you become at doing this, the better you would become defending against various types of joint locks, whether standing or on the ground. And now it takes a lot of relaxation and mental training. It's mostly mental. It's not technique based. Okay. So if you think, uh, again, about say a wrist lock and I, and I use it because it's an easy example. All right. If your right wrist, the wrist of your right hand is being locked, where do I want to put my attention and my intention? Besides what I said earlier, just trying to move everything that's not under the opponent's control. Of, of course, it must be in directions in, in, in a manner that's conducive to, to you and not helping the opponent. But where do I want to put my intention and attention if the lock is on my right wrist? I would want to put them in my left foot. The exact opposite side of the body in all respects and if it was my left foot that's being locked then if possible I would want to put my attention in the right wrist and first move from it because if I am fo if I'm being locked I, I, I'm someone's trying to do an ankle lock on my left foot then the wrong idea would be to try to struggle where the lock is happening. This is where the opponent already has stability. He has established control over there. 
And when I try to resist over there, what I'm creating is more tension. And more tension equals more stability. So I'm helping my opponent. As opposed to the situation where I go to the exactly the opposite other side of the body. And I try to move that first. So, for, for example, if we're on the ground and someone's trying to do an ankle lock on, again, on my um, left foot then I am going to try to put my right wrist on the ground and as also as far away from the opponent as possible and begin the whole body movement of all the three parts that could move from that right wrist, potentially. Could, could be from the other side in other respects, could be from my right elbow or my right shoulder, depending on the angle in which I'm, I'm positioned, but I'm just saying, do not focus on when where the action is happening in favor of the opponent. Focus on where the opponent has the least control. So this is just general advice for how to deal with joint locks when they are applied on you. But here's some interesting and related advice on where and how you put your attention and intention when you are trying to apply a joint lock. So it's similar in the sense that most people are trying to focus their attention exactly on that point where they are applying the lock. So, um, for instance, if I'm trying to lock someone's elbow, most people would put all of their strength and attention and intention into that middle of the elbow. However, that might not be the best way to do it. And I'll explain why. Because if you are trying to apply the lock and you are putting your attention, intention and force into this one singular point, then what happens is that you lose control over the rest of the opponent's body. And he, he doesn't even have to know of that advice that I gave earlier. He could just move wildly and then you don't have that stable base. If you really want to control your opponent better, you have to extend your force, attention and intention through that point to the rest of the opponent's body. Now, this takes a higher level of skill and it's not as easy to learn and apply like the defensive advice that I gave earlier. To do that, you really ought to be breathing deeply into your Dantian, unite your body as a single unit and be able to transfer that power from one point on the opponent's body into another, preferably all the way into the opponent's spine. And why the opponent's spine? Because if you control someone's spine, you control their entire body. When people manipulate their opponent's head, the goal is to control their body through the spine. Because the, if you control the head, you control the spine. If you control the spine, you control the entire body. But again, this is something that is very difficult to describe through an online lecture on Jadecast. You need a qualified teacher to show you how to do this. How do you transfer your force, attention and intention from one point of the, in the opponent's body, even through the opponent's fingers or wrists or, or toes, all the way to their spine so that you can control their entire body and then it will be much more difficult for them to resist your joint lock. Well, even though it's difficult to describe and to teach, I can try and give you some advice. What you would be trying to do when you can practice this yourselves and you have to do it very slowly with a cooperative partner because most learning is cooperative. You don't do most learning through sparring with, with other people and through fighting. That's applying the learning and that's learning specific condensed lessons. But most of the learning you have to learn to cooperatively. And otherwise, some people could learn from just fighting, but then they don't really understand. If you want to learn and understand and be able to apply, most of it has to be cooperative. Anyhow, I digress. Back to the back on topic. When you apply the joint lock, try to imagine a line of energy going through the point where the, the lock is applied, climbing, say you're, you're locking the elbow, climbing all the way from the elbow through the, through 
for the arm to the shoulder uh, to the, the side of the neck from the neck down the spine to the middle of the spine don't try to just put all of that energy attention and intention in that one point but rather create in your mind that line of force that goes from the point where the joint lock is happening all the way to the opponent's spine and then then you can do things that would look almost fake miraculous because people do not imagine that such a thing is possible even though it's not that difficult to learn or do it's just not very commonly used or applied or people who know this typically learn it learn it intuitively like i said through fighting but then they don't understand it and they can't teach it it works for them you don't see it and you don't understand and they don't understand how it works so well for them but essentially this is probably part of what they're doing now it doesn't mean that you solely need to control the spine as a matter of fact you could use the same method to control other parts of the opponent's body so and it doesn't have to be in a joint lock so for instance when you get really good at it you can grab someone's uh, arm and affect the other arm which can be very useful for self-defense in all sorts of situations uh, let's say someone is going to punch you with the left hand but you are currently grabbing or touching the right hand you can transfer a certain level of power and influence for the right hand to affect the left hand to maybe not stop the person entirely from punching with the left hand while you're touching the right hand but making sure that that punch would miss or be ineffective or would kind of stop or uh, become less powerful midway by the influence that you sent from one hand to the other or uh, see someone was wielding a knife but he was wielding it with one hand and you only had access to a foot or the other hand then you could use the same principle to affect the knife hand to maybe not make the other person drop the knife not necessarily but you can make them imbalanced enough on the inside that the knife would miss cutting you at least a few times i mean working against a knife is very difficult but i'm just saying the same type of principle delivering the line of power using your intention from one part of the opponent's body to another part of the opponent's body is a very useful skill and it can be applied in all sorts of interesting ways it can also be applied to uh, uproot the opponent so you touch the, the opponent and you make them lose their footing because you transfer your power instead of you touching their hands and keeping the the power at that point in their around their their hands and forearms you transfer the power to the bottoms of their feet and then they lose their footing and their rooting and they find that they're not as stable and then you can move them around and perhaps toss them to the ground etc etc it is a very useful skill and it's not limited to just joint locks anyhow i hope you have enjoyed this short lecture on how to better apply and defense against joint locks if you'd like to learn more about the martial arts then first please tap that subscribe button on the channel because i am going to just fill it up with tons and tons of fascinating lectures and interviews and share a lot of additional information akin to what i was just talking about on many many different types of martial arts related subjects and also you're most welcome to have a look at my books that i've written and published over the years you can go on any amazon affiliated website of your choice like amazon.com amazon.co.uk amazon.de doesn't matter my books are on all of them and go to that search bar and write research of martial arts or the martial arts teacher these are the names of my books you can just write my name down jonathan bluestein you'd find them also anyhow i hope that you gain some insight from this lecture of mine and there are many more coming keep in touch and i'll see you next time